Good evening, everyone. We find ourselves gathered to discuss an album that not only defined its era, but continues to resonate with listeners today. In 1973, against a backdrop of war, political disillusionment, and a burgeoning counterculture, Pink Floyd gifted the world with Dark Side of the Moon. A masterstroke in sound, it encapsulated the mood of the masses like few records before or since. Let's begin with initial thoughts on this seminal work. Izzy, start us off. Well, Hal, it's the audacity for me, the way it pulled from the zeitgeist of chaos and introspection, giving us a vignette into society's psyche. It's art that both reflects and challenges cultural norms. That's a convenient gloss. Remember, we're talking about a band that capitalized on the very system it critiqued. This wasn't about changing the game, but playing it incredibly well. Perhaps, Mick, but it's impossible to ignore the philosophical overtones. It speaks to something intrinsic in all of us, this grappling with mortality, madness, and the ticking away of time. Come now, philosophy. It's clever songwriting, but let's not overestimate its depth. Its legacy lies in the craft, not some supposed philosophical insights. I must interject. Aren't you underplaying the technological innovation here? The craft is the message in many ways. They turned the studio into a playground of the avant-garde. And yet it remains firmly rooted in the musical traditions. Innovation doesn't preclude the influence of what came before. A strong point from Mick on influences. Tradition and innovation are vastly intertwined in Dark Side of the Moon. It's a robust conversation to say the least. We've set quite the stage for our upcoming discussions. As we delve into the philosophical bearings of Dark Side of the Moon, we can't ignore its impact on the cultural zeitgeist of the early 70s. Amelia, your wide-ranging grasp on existentialism seems to intertwine with the album's themes. It does indeed, Hal. The album's exploration of time, greed, and the fear of death mirror existentialist concerns. It's about individual perception, isn't it? The abyss that Sartre spoke of seems to echo in Gilmore's haunting solos. But Amelia, isn't existentialism a shade bleaker than what Waters penned? I contend that what we're hearing is a more humanist outcry. It's not just about existence. It's about the shared struggle, the commonality of these fears, not their isolation. Shared it may be, Lenny, but the album presents a solitary journey, a metaphor for personal realization and the ultimate confrontation with self. Hmm, a compelling point. But isn't humanism too broad a term? The album does delve into more nuanced postmodern doubts. It's a pastiche of styles and existential crises, not just an anatomical study of human perseverance. Precisely, jazz. It's the fragmentation of the self and the reality that resonates with postmodern theory. This idea of nonlinear narratives and indeterminate truths seems to run through the album. Hang on, though. I'm not sold on defining it strictly through such a philosophical lens. The album transcends, not pigeonholes. Postmodern thought was but one current amidst many others it swam through. Izzy, it's one thing to say it transcends, but another to ignore the clear resonance of philosophical thought. Doesn't the album reflect the essence of postmodernism in its skepticism towards grand narratives? Skepticism, yes, but the album speaks through its empathy just as loudly. I think it projects more than cold philosophical skepticism. It talks of the soul in despair. Back to Lenny's point, Humanist or not, could we consider the album as a precursor to postmodernism rather than a product of it? Nice stroke, Mick. But the album emerged when postmodernism was already well underway. It flourished within that environment and perhaps simply mirrored contemporary thoughts. Then how do we account for the complexities of its narrative within that frame? The album's refusal to settle on any single interpretation seems to point us back towards a postmodern reading, doesn't it? Absolutely, the abject horror at the inevitabilities of life's passage, which the album wrestles with, can't be untangled from a postmodern crisis of meaning or lack of it. Yet, I retain that the humanity in Waters' lyrics and the overarching need for connection point towards a fundamentally humanist stance, nuanced by postmodern conditions, but humanist at its core. The evolution of psychedelic rock and the role of Dark Side of the Moon in music production cannot be overstated. 
Let's delve into this subject. Pink Floyd didn't just push the envelope. They rewrote the rule book with this album. Their intricate studio techniques like multi-track recording and use of synthesizers became a blueprint for future artists. I must jump in here. While revolutionary, it's crucial to recognize that they stood on the shoulders of giants. Earlier psychedelic works laid the foundation. Agreed, Mick, but Pink Floyd's execution was unmatched. They transformed those existing ideas into something truly unparalleled, wouldn't you say? Jazz, that's partially true. However, I believe it was the way they married those techniques with existential themes. They turned sound into a vessel for profound questions. Amelia, you're onto something. The existentialism embedded in their sound was a new dawn, but we can't forget the primal impact of human emotion in their music, which blended with technology to deepen the listener's experience. I appreciate your point, Lenny. It's that very emotion that resonated with the counterculture movement of the time, capturing the zeitgeist in a way that can't be attributed to technical innovation alone. They indeed provided a voice to a disenchanted generation. Speaking of disenchantment, let's reflect on the psychedelic genre's trajectory and how Dark Side influenced it. Dark Side was an inflection point. It took the psychedelia's experimental ethos and filtered it through a more accessible lens. They took it from underground to mainstream, yet kept its rebellious spirit. True, but we must not ignore the leap in production values. It allowed for a cleaner, more sophisticated sound. This wasn't just about rebellion, it was art. Such a shift in production also meant that Pink Floyd set a new standard for sound quality and album concept. Following Dark Side, it wasn't just about the music. The entire package of the album became an art form. And that commodification of the album concept is exactly why it had such a polarizing impact. Commercially triumphant, but triggering a debate about whether it really served the counterculture or just capitalized on it. An interesting contention, Izzy. We're witnessing a legacy that bridges realms of both music and cultural conversations. Let's keep exploring these intersections as we move forward in our discussion. As we delve into the album's narrative, we cannot overlook its profound engagement with mental health, a bold statement for its time, indeed. Absolutely. The dark side of the moon confronted the stigmas of mental illness head on. The empathy and depth with which it approached Sid Barrett's descent into mental illness was pioneering. And yet I wonder, would it be heralded or criticized today? The landscape of mental health awareness has shifted substantially. That's a fair point, Amelia. The conversation has evolved, but think about how progressive it was for the 70s. They used their platform to shine a light on an issue that remains pertinent today. Despite that, though, hasn't some of the language aged poorly? We're much more nuanced in our discussions of mental health now. Nuanced, but are we any more effective? Back then, they had fewer words, but perhaps more substance. It's not just about words, Mick. It's about context the depth of understanding. The album provided a relatable context that many still find solace in. The nuances are important, Jazz. They reflect our growing understanding of mental health. But I agree with Izzy. The album created a shared experience that is timeless. The universal quality of music as a shared experience certainly amplifies the album's relevance. Can we really talk about timeless shared experiences when we refer to an era-specific piece of art? The context is key. And this album is a product of its time. Lenny, that's precisely what makes it so fascinating. Despite being a product of its time, it transcends it. We're still discussing its relevance to mental health today, aren't we? Even so, there is a romanticization of pain in this album that could be seen as problematic through a contemporary lens. I must weigh in here. Romanticization? Perhaps. But isn't it the raw and authentic expression of human experience that really resonates with people? Jazz is right, and it's that authenticity that makes the album's approach to mental illness continue to be relevant. It validates the listener's feelings rather than trivializing them. I suppose the authenticity cannot be denied, even if our perspective on mental health has evolved. There's a certain truth to the emotional resonance it maintains, a truth that speaks volumes about the human experience. Music as an outlet for emotional turmoil remains as relevant now as it did then.
Let's delve into the technological innovations behind Dark Side of the Moon. This album truly was a pioneer of its time. Lenny, could you start us off? Certainly. The use of the synthesizer stood out with modular synthesis at its heart. It wasn't just about playing notes, it's about sculpting soundscapes that convey emotions. That innovation didn't happen in a vacuum, though. It was influenced by the classical electronic music from decades earlier. Amelia's point is well taken, but let's not underestimate the significance of Alan Parsons' engineering mastery. Quadraphonic sound was revolutionary. Agreed, jazz. But it's the application that made it groundbreaking. The way they merged the technology with the music was unparalleled. It's the humanity behind the tech, isn't it? The album expressed complex emotional states through sophisticated technology. Izzy, technology is one thing, but we must credit the musicianship. Without Pink Floyd's vision, those synths would be mere novelties. A harsh assessment there, Mick. Remember, using synths was a daring choice that shaped music for decades to follow. The Moog synthesizer alone transformed what we thought possible in sound, and it set the stage for today's electronic music genre. True, but think about the tape loops, the choice of non-instruments, cash registers, clocks. They were sampling before sampling existed. And that's the genius that reverberates into the current era. It taught us that music production goes beyond notes and chords. It's an immersive experience. An immersive experience that continues to evolve. But let's remember, Dark Side of the Moon stands as a pillar that modern artists look back to for inspiration. The 1970s were a time of deep social and political upheaval. Dark Side of the Moon seems to capture that malaise, dissecting the fabric of society with its themes. Mick, your thoughts? Indeed, Hal. It's an unforgiving mirror to the world's face, really. The album doesn't shy from laying bare the societal ills, capitalism, war, the rot within human connection. It reflects the disillusionment of the era, the echo of protests against Vietnam, against inequality. More than that, it seems to zero in on the personal impacts, how those political storms racked individual psyches. Those lyrics, the sounds, they don't just tell a story, they demand we feel it as if we're lost right alongside the generation that first heard them. Engaging with the listener's emotions is powerful, indeed. Talking of personal impact, one cannot ignore the technological consequences of individualism promoted in the 70s. The album appeals to that solitude through its intimate soundscapes. Pink Floyd essentially used the studio as an instrument in itself, amplifying their social commentary. Jazz, while technology is a component, it was a vehicle, not the heart. The real driver was the content, dialogue about the human condition. A moment, Izzy. Not just any dialogue, hard-hitting, uncomfortably accurate depictions. Take money, a relentless critique of greed. You can't tell me that wasn't a direct jab at the capitalism's ethos. It was, Mick. However, don't you think we risk romanticizing it? The album critiques, yes, but it's not an activist manifesto. It's art, reflecting its time, not necessarily rallying for change. That's where I'd challenge you, Lenny. While it may not be an overt call to arms, art is inherently political. Calling out greed, the dehumanization amidst conflict, Pink Floyd was decidedly subversive, not just artistic. Political, maybe, subversive, I doubt. The 70s birthed more radical calls to action than an elliptical rock album. You're downplaying it, Lenny. The personal is political. By delving into the psyche damaged by these larger forces, Pink Floyd was unmasking society's grander failures. Exactly, Izzy. Their choice to address such issues in their music was in itself a brave political act, exposing the failures of an entire system. Let's not forget, though, that they were experimenting with sound while doling out this social critique. Dark Side of the Moon wasn't just a reflection, it was also a product of its time, progressive in both form and content. The album indeed seems to exist at that intersection, between art and message, between technology and human experience. Despite differing opinions, its relevancy and impact are something we clearly recognize even today. Let's delve into the use of soundscapes and audio effects in Dark Side of the Moon. The way Pink Floyd employed these elements really crafted a bridge to the listener's emotions. 
The layering of sound they achieved is astonishing. Think about On The Run, a soundscape that really epitomizes this. It has a kinetic feel, almost palpable anxiety that's conveyed through the looping synthesizers and sequencers. It's those heartbeats, the cash registers, and the laughter that dragged you in, isn't it? They didn't just make music. They created an auditory experience that mirrors life's chaos and routine. And on brain damage, the laughter, it's chilling and existential. But I must distinguish, it's not just sound for sound's sake. It's carefully orchestrated to reflect the psyche. Incisively put, Izzy, the laughter serves more than a narrative purpose. It resonates on a nearly primordial level with the listener. But how does this compare to, say, classical music, where emotion is evoked purely through instrumentation? Is the effect more profound with these effects? That's a stretch. Comparing it to classical is a bit generous. It's provocative, but hardly groundbreaking. Holsts the planets, stirred emotions, without such parlor tricks. I must interject, Lenny. The purposeful inclusion of these effects serves as a narrative tool adding layers to the music that classical compositions inherently lack due to their different context and time. The relevance is not diminished, though. The album's capacity to evoke emotion transcends its era. It's timeless. It's the vulnerability in time that gets me every time. It's reflective and visceral, and those clocks at the beginning are a harsh reminder of mortality. Harsh, yes, but also essential. The sound effects are milestones on this journey they're taking us through marking the passage through various stages of life and consciousness. And isn't that the heart of it? We're not just listening to music, we're undergoing an experience that's almost cinematic in its unfolding. Perhaps the album is cinematic, but let's not overstate the originality. Using sound effects to create an atmosphere was not pioneered by Pink Floyd. Nonetheless, Lenny, it was the way they harmonized those effects with the music that was transformative. It's not only the innovation, but the execution that matters. Indeed, it seems the consensus here is that Dark Side of the Moon used sound as an integral storytelling device, not merely as ornamentation. Whether it was original or not seems secondary to its lasting emotional impact. Let's turn our focus to the cross-disciplinary influences within Dark Side of the Moon. Amelia, how do you perceive the album's connection to other cultural mediums of its era? Well, Hal, I think the album encapsulates not just the sound of its time, but also the narrative spirit of the 70s. It reflects the existential questions posed in contemporary cinema and literature, inviting listeners to a broader introspection, much like the works of Truffaut or Godard. While that's a valid observation, I'd argue the album goes beyond just reflecting its time. It dialogues with scientific and philosophical ideas that were on the frontier of human understanding. It's almost like a nod to Kuhn's paradigms in the structure of scientific revolutions. Disagree there, Izzy. It's more than mere dialogue. This album distills complex ideas. The lyrics, the sound, they're practically a homage to a multitude of scientific advances, mirroring the societal upheaval of the 70s. Hold on. Distillation implies simplification which you can't say is true for Dark Side of the Moon. They've managed to encapsulate the complexities of the human psyche in ways that are anything but simplified. The philosophical undercurrents are dense, not distilled. And with those complexities, they've achieved something akin to a score for the human experience. It grasped concepts, both literate and scientific, and threaded them into the fabric of its soundscapes. In a way, it's predictive of the interdisciplinary approaches we see in today's art and science. Exactly, jazz. You see, the seamlessness of how it weaves different influences is, is quite breathtaking. They were drawing from such ethereal realms of human thought, and yet they've grounded it so masterfully. I'm cautious about how we allocate praise for drawing on these different realms. Yes, they've integrated academic influences, but let's not forget its roots in rock and roll. It's important when we speak of transcending genres that we don't lose sight of the cultural foundation from whence it came. That's it, Izzy. They didn't abandon rock. They curated its evolution by introducing a multitude of influences into it. That's why it resonated and still resonates on so many levels. What made it extraordinary wasn't abandoning its base, but expanding upon it. 
Perhaps it's the ambiguity within those expansions that we should also consider. A lot is left open for interpretation, which is why it continues to be a subject of analysis and debate. Just like any robust scientific theory, isn't it? But let's not overindulge in glorification. Their approach was innovative, but not unparalleled. Many artists of the time were experimenting cross-disciplinarily. Pink Floyd happened to do it in a way that stuck. It's clear the album serves as an intersection for various streams of thought, from science to philosophy to literature. It arguably fostered a wider cultural conversation, evidenced by the rich and diverse interpretations we've explored here. We turn now to one of the more whimsical aspects of the album, a supposed synchronicity with The Wizard of Oz. Lenny, what are your thoughts on this theory? It's a delightful urban legend, but the idea that Dark Side of the Moon was deliberately crafted to sync with The Wizard of Oz is baseless. There's no concrete evidence, and the band has repeatedly denied it. Coincidences make for great tales, but that's all they are, coincidences. Interesting viewpoint, Lenny but let's not discount the power of coincidences in creating cultural narratives. Whether intended by Pink Floyd or not, the link between the album and film has become part of the album's mystique. It speaks to how people search for deeper meaning in art. Mick, that's a compelling angle. Culture is replete with these connections that, intentional or not, elevate our experience of art. Pink Floyd created something that transcended their original intentions, becoming a canvas for people's imaginations. That may be so, but the power of narrative we're discussing, a myth that enhances the album's status, cannot be attributed to just coincidence. If nothing else, this synchronicity myth has sparked discussions about intertextuality in modern art forms. And let's not forget, these myths shape the way we consume art. They encourage us to make our own interpretations to find our own truths. The dark side of the rainbow phenomenon is part of the reason the album remains so alive in public consciousness. Fair points all, but we mustn't let myths lead us astray. The myth you're fond of adds little to the album's literary merit or the skill exhibited in its production. Perhaps not, but the cultural conversation it generates is significant. Art isn't created in a vacuum and it shouldn't be critiqued in one either. Culture evolves and myths are a part of that evolution. They enrich the fabric of the narrative we share as a society, adding layers that resonate with each new generation. Well, when myths encourage active engagement with the art, imagining, theorizing, discussing, then those myths serve a purpose. They keep the work relevant. Exactly, Jazz. And while purists might argue against such myths, the energy and curiosity they incite is invaluable. It's proof of the album's impact on multiple levels of culture. It seems then, whether as mythology or coincidence, the conversation surrounding Dark Side of the Moon and The Wizard of Oz adds a fascinating dimension to our understanding of the album and its cultural penetration. The myth, like the album, continues to captivate and inspire. We now turn to the economic and cultural impact of Dark Side of the Moon on the music industry. Mick, can you start us off with your perspective on the album's business side? Well, it's quite remarkable. The album's not only a mainstay in the charts, spending an unprecedented amount of time in the Billboard 200, but it also shifted the industry's focus towards album-oriented rock. The sheer volume of sales transformed the economic landscape for rock bands. I'd like to add that it wasn't just sales figures. Dark Side of the Moon became a cultural phenomenon. It influenced fashion, language, and opened up the gates for concept albums to be a serious form of artistic expression in the mainstream. That's true. But we shouldn't overlook how it revolutionized marketing strategies in music. Pink Floyd masterfully created not just an album, but a brand that resonated deeply with its audience. Absolutely. But let's not romanticize it. The success of Dark Side of the Moon also ushered in an era where commercial interests sometimes overshadowed artistic integrity in the music industry. A fair point, but it didn't happen in a vacuum. Dark Side of the Moon was exceptional in combining artistic depth with mass appeal. That's not selling out, that's reaching out. Yet, yeah, it's important to stay critical about these things. 
The album's success story often overshadows the struggles of countless other bands who couldn't hit that sweet spot between commercial and artistic victory. Lenny, the market decides, and it decided that Dark Side of the Moon was worth the attention and the dollars. Its success propelled not only Pink Floyd, but also the ambition of many other bands in that era. I concur with Jazz there. The album's impact went beyond Pink Floyd. It set a new standard in the industry for what a successful album looks like, influencing marketing, distribution, and production for years to come. And with that standard came an expectation for quality, a legacy that we're still unpacking today. Thank you for the robust discussion, everyone. Let's prepare for our final segment, where we'll discuss the fascinating visual aspects of the album. Moving on to the visual impacts, Dark Side of the Moon isn't just audibly revolutionary. The album artwork and packaging became a cultural icon. Jazz, your interdisciplinary perspective should shed light on this. The Dark Side of the Moon cover by Storm Thorgerson is simplicity married to symbolism. Its prism dispersing light into color is a stroke of genius, mirroring the album's complex themes through a simple image. It's as much a brand of Pink Floyd as the music itself. Precisely, jazz. The visual language was deliberate, the prism a metaphor for the band's sound and societal fragmentation of the 70s. It transcended being mere cover art and became symbolic of counterculture. Inviting yet enigmatic, it's a visual puzzle, much like the album's sonic explorations. Though I see your points, the simplicity could be misconstrued as underwhelming. There's a contrarian view here. Was the design too minimalist? We're talking placards for a socio-political revolution where more explicit imagery could have been a louder rallying cry. Minimalist, yes, but underwhelming? Hardly. It evokes curiosity, draws you in. Overly explicit art can become dated, but Thorgerson's design has achieved timelessness by leaving room for personal interpretation. That's an interesting debate, but to undercut Thorgerson's ingenuity is to ignore the fact that he captured the essence of the era. It marked a move away from psychedelic patterns to a slick modern aesthetic, aligning with the band's forward-thinking approach. Yet, if we dissect historical success, isn't there a risk we see intent where there was none? Could it merely be fortuitous that this design became so iconic? I believe intent and accident coalesce in art. The design's lasting impact is undeniable, regardless of fortuity. Thorgerson managed to brand an entire movement of progressive rock with a simple emblem of light and shadow. That's no small feat. Regardless of intent, it has etched itself into the consciousness of music and art enthusiasts alike. Would anyone say that the packaging is non-essential to how we experience the album? Far from non-essential, packaging mediates the relationship between the art and the audience. The artwork for Dark Side of the Moon envelops us, primes our senses for the auditory expedition within. Right, Mick. And it's not just an envelope, it's an integral part of what made the album so monumental. It garners intrigue before the first note is played. Exactly, Amelia. The artwork acts as a portal. It's the album's emissary, speaking volumes without a single lyric or note. It invigorated the allure surrounding Pink Floyd, cementing their status in rock history. The significance of cover artwork is clear. It's pivotal in the legacy and marketing of Dark Side of the Moon, and its appeal remains undiminished, inevitably woven into the narrative of the album itself. As we draw our discussion to a close, I'm eager to hear your final thoughts on Dark Side of the Moon. This album, Crossing the Chasms of Time, has nestled itself into the annals of not just music, but culture at large. Indeed, Hal. The album is a cultural monolith. It pushes us to confront the gnawing void of war, madness, and the relentless pressure of time, themes that are just as relevant today as they were in the 70s. True, Amelia, it's timeless. But the technological leap this album represented cannot be understated. It's a cornerstone for modern sound engineering, a harbinger for what music could and has become. Technology aside, jazz, it's the human element that endures. The album's genius lies in its capacity to articulate the profound solitude and common fears that bind us all. Lenny hits the nail on the head. It's more than sound, it's the raw human connection, 
an unvarnished look at the psyche, a masterclass in empathy. I'll concede it's a crossroads of human experience. However, its cultural impact owes just as much to commercial success as it does to any philosophical depth. It's not just art, it's a historical artifact marking a zenith in the music industry. Your point is taken, Mick, but reducing it to commercial impact understates its artistic merits. The legacy of Darkseid isn't just in the numbers, it's in the stories it tells and the minds it moves. And let's not forget the visual identity, the iconic prism. It's become synonymous with Pink Floyd and is emblazoned in rock iconography. That alone speaks volumes of its pervasive influence. The design encapsulates the essence of the album, simple but profound, much like the music itself. Visual and auditory, it's a total work of art. Visually, sonically, culturally, Dark Side of the Moon has seeped into the fabric of our lives. It's as much a mirror for the individual as it is for society. And with that, our discussion comes to a close. Just like the album itself, our conversation weaves through darkness and light, reflecting the multifaceted nature of Pink Floyd's work. Its enduring legacy undoubtedly stands testament to its ability to resonate across generations.